Other classes of preferences include participating, convertible and redeemable preferences. A participating preference shareholder is entitled to over and above their fixed annual preference dividend per year to a portion of the remaining profits that would be declared in the form of the ordinary dividend. So they participate in the ordinary dividend as well, usually with reference to a percentage of the ordinary dividend. So when you're a participating preference shareholder, you'll get your fixed annual amount per year as well as a portion of the ordinary dividend. Your convertible preference shares may be converted into ordinary shares at a predetermined ratio. You could, for instance, convert two preference shares. For every two preference shares, you get four ordinary shares or whatever the ratio might be. And then your redeemable preference shares is a financial liability instrument. They will be redeemed by delivering cash at a specific time in future. So the shareholder will receive cash back on this investment. It is considered a financial liability accounted for in terms of IFRS 9 and the dividend on this instrument will be regarded as finance cost. In chapter 8, it is assumed, unless otherwise stated, that your preference shares are neither redeemable nor convertible, that they are cumulative preference shares and that the preference shares are not participating preference shares. Now that we have a better understanding of the nature and different classes of preference shares, let's talk about the effect on the consolidation process if the equity of the subsidiary now also includes preference shares. The moment that happens, you have more equity participants in the subsidiary. Up until this point, the equity participants in S was the ordinary shareholders. Now, your equity participants in S will be the ordinary shareholders and the preference shareholders. But we will follow the normal consolidation process. And as we move along and as we go through the examples, you will see that we're just adding onto what we've already been doing up until this point as part of this consolidation process. The first important point to address is the aspect of control. Remember, you only have to prepare consolidated financial statements if there is a parent that has control over the subsidiary and the business combination as a result of that. Now, your normal rules of control apply. The acquisition of preference shares does not give rise to any control. Your control is therefore still determined with reference to the ordinary shareholding. It can even happen that the parent does not have any interest in the preference shares of the subsidiary. Control is still determined in the normal way with reference to the ordinary shareholding. The main reason for that relates to the fact that your preference shareholders usually do not have any voting rights. Therefore, they will not have power over the relevant activities of the subsidiary and if you do not have power you cannot have control. It is the ordinary shareholder that has the voting rights that has the potential to direct the relevant activities gaining the control through the power over those relevant activities. When the equity of the subsidiary now includes preference share capital and there's more equity participants, the most important effect on the consolidation process is that the equity of S must now be attributed to two classes of equity participants. Up until this point, we have attributed the equity of the subsidiary only to the ordinary shareholder equity participants. 
We did that either on the timeline or in the analysis of equity. But now that same equity of S needs to be attributed to more equity participants. The preference shareholders also being equity participants of the subsidiary. If we sit with a scenario where the parent company has an 80% interest in the ordinary shares of S, I have 20% for non-controlling interests. Just remember again that control is determined with reference to the investment in the ordinary shares. The parent company can then end up having only 10% in the preference shares of the subsidiary and that will mean that 90% of the interest in the preference shares of the subsidiary relates to non-controlling interests. Remember your non-controlling interests are all the equity participants in the subsidiary that do not have control and control is not determined with reference to the preference share investment. Now if you look at this picture in front of you and you have one amount for equity of S, let's assume something like retained earnings. How will you take one amount retained earnings of S and attribute that in these ratios to your equity participants? And that would be the focus of chapter 8. Just to make it a little bit more visual, I have there as an analogy for the equity of S a cake. And what we need to do when we now attribute the equity of S is we need to slice up that cake so that each of these equity participants get a piece of that cake that they are entitled to. When we attribute the equity of S to the equity participants, we determine how much of that equity of S are these equity participants entitled to. We will spend a lot of time on this in an analysis of equity on the timelines going forward in this chapter.